It is January 22nd. I'm Brian Hasbrook with the Brooklyn Public Library. I'm joined with Robert Solomon, uh, born on 9, 1950, uh, for the Brooklyn Public Library's Our Streets, Our Stories project. We are at uh, King's Highway Branch. So, Robert, um, tell me, uh, where were you born? Uh, so I was born in Manhattan, but uh, lived in Williamsburg about uh, five years old. And I still have tremendous memories of Williamsburg simply because my grandparents continued to live there. And in those days, you went and visited grandparents. Uh, and every weekend, my cousins and I uh, and our families would go back to Williamsburg. And for major holidays like Passover, we'd spend the week in Williamsburg. So uh, I still remember that very, very well. And actually drive through it every now and then just to see the old streets. Unfortunately, the houses that were there are not there anymore, but the, the memories are there. Yes. Uh, I grew up th uh, for the next 10 years in Crown Heights, uh, and then went to, we moved to um, East Flatbush, lived there for about seven years, and then finally moved here to Flatbush, Ocean Avenue, uh, living here for about 40 years now, 40 some odd years. Uh, what, what do you, do you remember if there were any uh, major differences between the neighborhoods that you lived in? Well, yes, there, there, there were. In Williamsburg, when I was a kid, it wasn't as Hasidic as it is today. So, for example, the biggest um, synagogue uh, at that time was not the Satmar, who are the predominant um, group that are there now, but rather uh, the Young Israel, which was a modern Orthodox uh, synagogue. My father actually became president um, and hired the, uh, the final rabbi that they kept all these years uh, in that synagogue. Uh, the neighborhood gradually started changing because of the influx of immigrants after World War II. Um, and at first it was Satmar, and now they have additional Hasidic groups that are there, but Satmar is the predominant, and they kind of control that area. Uh, when we moved to Crown Heights, Crown Heights was a very, very modern, uh, kind of upscale uh, place. In fact, my father always says how you had to know somebody just to get into Crown Heights. Um, we never owned a house. We were always tenants. Uh, but when we moved to Crown Heights, our landlord and landlady were like our auxiliary grandmother and grandfather. They were the, it was, it was a, a one-family house that was converted into two families, uh, but there were, there were no locked doors between us. So if we needed a bottle of milk, if she needed a bottle of milk, she'd come up in our refrigerator. If we wanted to raise the heat, we'd go down to that and raise the heat. Um, she was also, the landlady was also my first grade teacher, and um, she taught my sister to walk. It was a baby when we moved into, uh, into Crown Heights. Um, Crown Heights at that point, Lubavitch was a minor figure. Today they're the predominant figure in Crown Heights. Um, the nicest thing about the neighborhood was that everybody got along. It didn't matter what group you belonged to, it really didn't matter black or white, there was really no tension uh, in those days. And um, policemen were seen as your friend, you were told if you're having a problem, you need to cross the street, go to the policeman, things like that. Um, it was a very, very different uh, atmosphere, and people really did greet each other. Um, you know, people would just say hello to each other because they would pass each other and see each other. Uh, the neighborhood grocer knew you. If you didn't have money, you know, to come when you, if you were a kid and you came and said, my mommy needs uh, cream cheese or whatever, you know, I don't have my money with me, but bring it to me another time, don't worry. The, uh, the butcher, my sister always loved um, salami. Whenever we go in there, the butcher, of course, would have a slice of salami for her. Uh, people just knew you. The, the, um, in the supermarket, there was a supermarket on Empire Boulevard. The name was then Bernstein Brothers. The uh, fruit man, fruit and vegetable man, knew what you would take normally. You'd have it set aside for everybody knew you. The candy store was your second home. Um, you'd come in if you didn't have 10 cents in those days to buy a comic. Uh, you'd let you come and stand there and read it right there at the, at the shelf. Uh, if your mother wasn't home, you needed to hang out. Fine, give you a glass of water. You know, it was just a very, very, it was a beautiful time. Um, things began to change. The, the 60s came. Uh, some tensions began to go in. By the way, in those days in Crown Heights, when you, when you went past Eastern Parkway to uh, St. John's Place, that was considered, quote, a bad neighborhood. With that meant, and the reason you would go there is because Sam Ash had a big store and you wanted to get kazoos and things to play with. Um, a bad neighborhood in those days meant that when you went there, you just chained up your bike. But that's what a bad neighborhood meant in those days. Um, the reason we moved from Crown Heights was simply because there were no 
uh, rooms to be had. Uh, my sister and I were growing. We were sharing a bedroom. It wasn't going to work out anymore. I was turning 13, I was past 13, and we just couldn't do that. So we moved to uh, East Flatbush. And East Flatbush was, again, it was, it was interesting because um, our block was all 99% um, ortho modern Orthodox uh, people, a little more to the right, I say, than, than we were. And the surrounding area, same, same kind of thing. Um, but everyone, again, you, you got along. It wasn't like one group wouldn't talk to the other, or you're, you're not from me, so we don't go to your house, kind of thing. Um, then the area took a, a major change. Um, our landlady changed from, um, she was a white Jewish lady, to a, um, not Jamaica, but one of the West Indian uh, areas. And interestingly enough, uh, I always remember her name, Mrs. Hanley, because she was also a customer of my father, who had a store on the Lower East Side. So we got along well. We lived there for a few years. Um, but then the whole area really was, was changing, and um, we moved from there to Flatbush, which is where we kind of remained all these years. Uh, what, what type of store did your father own? He had a, um, he was a jobber. So he had a women's, children's, dry goods. A jobber, would, in those days, they don't have that anymore, really. It was sort of in between the wholesaler and the reseller. So you were kind of more towards the wholesale end uh, of things. And it was on uh, 54 Orchard Street, uh, which today is becoming an up-and-coming you know, condos and all days. But in those days, the entire Orchard Street was made up of merchants. Uh, so an aunt and uncle of mine on the next block over had a, a store where they sold little uh, gifts, you know, with China figures and things like that, and had, um, you know, st stole the front, things like that, so it's very different. Uh, you mentioned your sister. Did you have any other siblings? No, just my younger sister. And uh, how would you describe the family life? That uh, it's, it was so completely different uh, than, than, than you see today. First of all, we were an intact family, uh, very traditional. Uh, both religiously and um, secularly. My father was a veteran World War II. He uh, came home, he got married, he opened a store on the Lower East Side. Um, and he worked at that store for over 30, or over 30 years. The only reason he retired was really because um, the business itself was changing. Uh, jobbers were really not going to remain much longer. Uh, and also the landlord wanted to raise the rent tremendously. Now he and his neighbor next door, it was one building really, uh, he, he suggested that they buy the building, but they couldn't negotiate a price with the landlord that was acceptable. So he retired and after a year or so of being retired, he uh, uh, didn't want to be retired anymore. So he became a credit manager and worked for the next, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years as a credit manager. With the, I don't even know the name of it, but anyway, coming back to there. Uh, so my father, uh, he was the one who went to work six days a week in those, in those, uh, in those days. Uh, the only real time I would see him when I was a baby, well, when I was a baby, I wouldn't, because I would have to go to bed before he even got home. He would get home 8, 8.30 at night. Um, as I got older, I would be in bed, but not sleeping yet, so he'd come in. Um, Friday night and Saturday were the days I would really get to see him. Friday night, we would go to synagogue together. Saturday, go to synagogue together. Friday afternoon was a little bit on the tougher side for me. Because Friday afternoon meant I had to sit down and review my lessons with him, my Hebrew lessons with him. I did not like that. Uh, and then he would go take a nap. And then we'd go back to synagogue later. Uh, uh, Sunday he was back at work already. The only day off I remember him ever really having was uh, July 4th. And he would take me rowing in Prospect Park. And I loved that. Even though the boats were leaky and you had to wait for the police to come around, they would pump out the boat. They were wooden boats in those days. They would come around the, uh, patrolling, they'd pump you out. Um, but as I got older, I was allowed to row the whole lake. And that was like a real accomplishment. Um, my mother, when we were younger, did not work. She had worked, you know, when they were first married. Um, she did the books uh, at a company. And then when we got older, uh, she went back to work part-time. So we were never latchkey kids, my sister and I. When, by the time we were home, she was home. And when we left for school, she was still home. Um, she made sure that you uh, had your lunch packed and, and that you got out of bed to go to school. <laughs> um, so it was a very traditional family. And we were very, very close on my mother's side with my grandparents, extremely close. Um, 
there was almost no difference between your parents and your grandparents. As I said before, we went every week. And you didn't go to visit because you had to go. You wanted to go. You had fun with them. My grandfather was a calligrapher by trade, which was very difficult, as you can imagine, through the, um, uh, the Depression when he really did anything and everything to earn some money. He um, shoveled snow in the winter if they, allowed, if they hired. He got arrested peddling newspapers on the subway because you weren't allowed to pedal. Um, he had problems uh, peddling um, little you know, things that you blow, noisemakers on New Year's Eve, anything to earn because there was, there was no money and there were six children. Um, so my, my mother was the oldest in her, in her family and uh, she completed high school. Uh, she went to work, of course, afterwards, and then when she got married, you know, she continued. What type of lessons uh, uh, did your grandparents teach you? Uh, I'd say the, the two biggest lessons. Um, for my grandfather, honesty to the nth degree. And my grandmother taught you uh, faith. Uh, if you, she was a wonderful listener. If you can come to her with any problem, and she would listen, and when she was finished, she would say to you one word in Hebrew, bitachon, faith. And she lived her life that way. She had, my grandmother had an extraordinarily tough life. Never a day did she complain or fail to have a smile. Um, when we were kids, for example, uh, even when we got older, we would just you know, buy her something, just, just to have, you know, to buy her something. And she always used to look and say, I, I have everything. What, what are you buying? I have everything. She, was in a, she lived right around the corner over here about when they finally, she had to move from Williamsburg because they were tearing down the, her block. She lived on 77 Morton Street. Mm -hmm. And what a shame that they tore down those beautiful brown, brown cells and put up these row houses, which are ugly as can be today. Um, and she never, ever liked living here. She felt it was too fancy and nobody was friends. And she was like the UN. She, when she passed away, we didn't even realize how many different kinds of people. We had Indians. Stopping, not American Indian, you know, from India and uh, uh, Asiatic. She was friends with the world. She loved people. Yeah. My yeah. grandfather was a, was a very, he was so straight that when Johnson created the Great Society in the, in the 60s and they grandfathered all those who were not able to work 40 quarters to get Social Security to now be able to get it, he refused to take it. He said, I didn't earn it, I won't take it. I never took it. Wow. Were you uh, close with any of your aunts or uncles? Oh, yeah. My, uh, I have um, uh, uh, two cousins who I was extremely close with. We, we were, my older cousin was two years older than I, and my younger cousin was six months younger, Alan and Richie, and their parents, who lived in the building where I live now. They lived on the second floor. Now I live on the sixth floor, but they had already moved by the time I moved in. They were married and so on. <clears throat> um, we did everything together. We went to well, we went to different elementary schools, but the same high schools. Uh, every weekend, they were the ones. Their father had a car. We didn't. So my aunt and uncle would pick us up from Flatbush, come to Crown Heights, go to Williamsburg. Uh, we went to summer camp together. Uh, we did everything together. Where did you? Um, you see, you just mentioned you went to high school. Where did you go to high school? It was called uh, BTA, which stood for Brooklyn Talmudical Academy. The official name was Yeshiva University High School for Boys, Brooklyn. Um, and that place was a riot. It was an extremely competitive school. So at the end, uh, each year, somebody would get into Columbia, for example. Um, most people would go to Brooklyn College and things like that, uh, City University. Um, but at the same time, it was a blast. You had a riot going there. The teachers were all characters. And we had nicknames for all. <laughs> Did... Um you, you mentioned you you went to that was an all boy all, that boys, was all school? boys school. Okay. Oh, uh, down the block when I first started it before they moved to their uh, next building, uh, it was on um, corner of uh, Church and Bedford. The next block down, they actually across at the corner of Church at uh, the corner of uh, Bedford and Snyder was the girls' school, which was called Central. Now you were not allowed to go anywhere there. So, for example, my older cousin Alan once wanted to get a note to one of the girls. So what do you do? Well, he went downstairs, borrowed the janitor's uniform, got a broom, pretended to be the janitor, and went in to deliver his note. Wow. <laughs> um, so when you graduated, uh, where did you 
Where'd you go first? Um, I started at Hunter. Um, the reason being was Matt and I never got along. We still don't get along. I, for some reason, if they knew about learning disabilities in those days, they would have known that I had a learning disability, obviously, in Matt. Because when it came to English, 97 on the region. Bio, 97. Uh, history, all those 85s, 90s, 95s, no problem. Matt, working my butt off with probably one of the best tutors in the city system who was known in those days, Mr. Septimus, who said to me when trying to teach me the um, verbal problems, it's not like you're not trying, but on the region, take another question. Um, just can't do it. Um, so I did, I did miserably on the SATs because of the, I did great in the English and blew the math. I was out in five minutes because I didn't know any, anything in there. And, um, but my average without, without math was a little over a 90 with it down to an 85 point something. <laughs> so Hunter accepted me on the 85 point something. But Hunter was an hour and a half each way travel, and Brooklyn College was closer. So after uh, about a year and a half or so at, at Hunter, I transferred to uh, Brooklyn College and graduated at that point um, uh, magna cum laude. What did you uh, study at Brooklyn? I majored in sociology and minored in psychology. How was your uh, experience at Brooklyn College? It's, oh, it was, uh, was great. Hunter co-ed at that point? Hunter was co-ed? Oh, yeah. Oh, you mentioned co-ed. Uh, I remember my first day at Hunter, uh, when the bell rang, I remember the school I would have, like, in each class would have the equivalent of maybe close to 100 students. So 400 for the whole school, which is not huge. Yeah. I come to Hunter the first day, and the bell rings, and literally thousands of students are pouring out, pouring out into the hall. And it's like, ah, you know, where are you going? You have to rush if you know Hunter, in those days before they had the newer buildings, you had to rush to get to, into an elevator because you had classes on anywhere from 1 to 13 stories. Anyway, um, uh, the co-ed part didn't, didn't bother me at all. I mean, I loved it. But we had a wonderful music class. In those days, you were required to take either music or art. And I took music because I loved music. And uh, we had a wonderful professor, a young man, who was head of the um, school orchestra. His name was uh, Professor Clayton Westerman. Very tall man, maybe about your height, or maybe a little bit taller. Very handsome young man. And the class, it was in one of these big auditorium kind of classes, about 100 some odd students, 99% women. And one day he happened to mention something about my wife and something, and this groan went up from all, and he turned so red, it was the cutest thing. So that was <laughs> co-head for him. <laughs> It, uh, did you notice any differences between uh, Brooklyn and Hunter? Uh, not really, other than, than the campus in those days. Um, but I, well, one difference for me would have been is that Brooklyn College in those days, even in the daytime, was almost like a yeshiva. There were so many modern Orthodox um, students there, men and, and women. So you didn't feel as much of a standout. Whereas in Hunter, I remember in most of my classes, I'd be the only one, for example, wearing a yarmulke. And I guess, you know, even though today it's probably harder to, to relate to, you still felt different. And even today I still feel that, you know, wearing a yarmulke, you, you represent a certain group. And it was always incumbent upon me, I felt, and we were taught that also, but some kids were more attentive, I guess, than others, that um, act a certain way. Because people will judge all of us uh, by it to, to an extent. Um, so I, I would always want to sit in the very back of the class and like, please teacher, don't notice me because if I don't know an answer, you'll think we're all stupid, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. <laughs> Did you, um, so the commute was a lot shorter, were you still living at home? Yeah. And um, I, I didn't have a car in those days. I didn't get a car until I was 21. So towards the uh, end of Brooklyn College, uh, I, I had a car. And... Um, it didn't really pay to take the car most time because you had to park further than if you would have walked from home practically. Yeah. Um, after you graduated Brooklyn College, uh, what did you embark upon next? I went to um, Columbia University for graduate uh, graduate school, and I got my master's in social work, um, in clinical social work. I was not interested in the welfare, and although we had to take courses in that, I had no interest in case management as they call it today. Mm -hmm. I teach that today. <laughs> Uh, but um, that was not what I was there. I was interested strictly in the psychiatric end of things. And um, had the, you know, two years uh, at Columbia. Studied with a couple of rather famous professors. One was uh, Richard Cloward, who was uh, damned because of Obama today, because he was considered a 
terrible socialist. He's, he, was, he did not really preach um, anything as radical as what Obama does in terms of uh, his socialistic views. He was, he was not like that at all. He happened to be a very, very wonderful man. And also a professor, Bill Schwartz, who kind of wrote the book on um, group work. And his student, Alex Gitterman, who's head of that department today at, um, at uh, Columbia, gets all the credit. <laughs> And, uh, did you notice any differences? Uh, were you still living at home during graduate work? Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I lived you, at home. Uh, was your sister still living at home as well? She got married when uh, when she finished, just when she was finishing college. Oh, okay. Uh, and then she moved to Teaneck, New Jersey. Oh, was that considered normal? Uh, at pretty the time? much. Yeah, A lot of people much. would get married and then leave Brooklyn. Well, no. Uh, she left Brooklyn because her husband was from uh, Passaic, New Jersey, oh. and had absolutely no intention of ever living in New York. Uh, and were you? You had mentioned that you were close with your two cousins, Alan and Richie. Were they? Uh, were they also going to school? Was it yeah. kind of like a generational? Like you yeah. were expected to go to school? When we, when, today, when you graduate high school, it's, it's like a really big deal. And um, in the uh, Jewish community, it's like, uh, oh, now you have to send me to Israel for a year. In my day, you got uh, your hand shook, and you were told, "Congratulations, where are you going to college?" And when you finish college, if you weren't going to grad school, is what job do you have? Um, so yes, it was. Uh, and my cousin Alan also went to uh, Brooklyn College. He then went to Columbia University. My uncle had gone to Columbia University before him, also in English. I started out as an English major until I took um, uh, Middle English, and I decided I think I would like to do something else. Yeah. And I took psychology actually by accident because it was the only course open, and kind of really loved it but um, did not want to have to do uh, the experimental. In those days, you had to actually do the rats and the mice, you know, in the lab. Today, mm -hmm. you do it online. I don't know how, but they do. Anyway, um, so Alan went to Columbia. Uh, Richie went to... Richie was a music major. He was accepted to Oberlin, but continued at Brooklyn. Brooklyn. I don't know why he chose Brooklyn, but he did. And then he got married and moved to China. He, he did, oh, he did a master's first in... Um, um, teaching English as a second language. And uh, he and his wife moved to China for two years, taught in an area called Kunming, which is about 2,000 miles from Beijing. Uh, came home, they moved to Vermont. And that's where they live till this day, and that's what they, uh, his wife teaches Spanish, and he teaches English as a second language. Did your other cousin also leave Brooklyn? Uh, Alan, Alan lived in Brooklyn. Well, when he first got married, he lived in Washington Heights, that's where his wife came from. But then they quickly moved to uh, Brooklyn, and lived right here on Ocean Avenue and Avenue T. And he swore he will never move from there. Uh, but as you know, the area has been developed and the condos were coming in. And he would have been the only one on the block left and squeezed in between two huge condos. And they offered him quite a bit, I understand, of money. And uh, he moved with tears in his eyes to Teaneck. Uh, now, about uh, 10 years later, or more, he has a big smile on his face. He really loves T-neck. I don't think he would come back here for anything. <laughs> um, so after you uh, you completed your, your graduate work, uh, what did you do then? Um, initially, I worked for almost eight years at a children's mental health clinic doing outpatient um, psychotherapy with, with children uh, right here in Bensonhurst. And then I eventually moved on to get into administration. And I uh, worked as a... They call it director, but it's not like director of the whole agency, but director of your unit um, uh, of various mental health clinics. Usually called in because they were having a problem and needed someone to clean it up. And um, fortunately, uh, Bensonhurst, the job in Bensonhurst had a very, very tough boss to work for. Uh, the head of the program was very tough. The administrator was a much nicer guy. Um, but he taught you how to run things correctly. Now, he did it in a kind of mean way, but nevertheless, you learned the right way. And I was able to use that in helping these clinics. So, for example, one clinic that I worked at, I remember the um, director saying to me, he says, are you sure you want to take this? He because I'm telling you, it's a mess. They had received what's called a Tier 3 rating, which is the lowest rating you can get on an audit, which means you have six months or, or so to clean it up or else the state will come in and clean it up for you or take away your license. I told him, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll do it. And uh, within a year, we had an audit. And I have to give credit to the staff, not just not just me. The staff that that wanted to remain. Some people said, you know, we're, we're leaving. 
um, in a year's time, you went from tier three to tier one, which means we'll see you in about five years. <laughs> you know, keep it up. Wow. So uh, uh, I did that. But at the same time, in most of these places, I, I didn't really enjoy uh, working with, with these guys. I, I worked at these places about close to 30 years. The reason I didn't enjoy it had nothing to do with the patients and nothing really to do, most most cases, with the staff. Upper administration was really always looking to use you to straighten out the mess, get us the program, get us the funding, and then we don't really need you in this position. So I, the last place that I worked at was uh, after getting them three programs set up and having in, in uh, about five or six year uh, run with those programs, uh, perfect audits in every one of them, meaning not one single correction needed. Uh, and in getting a commendation from the auditors, they decided that they don't really need you running that now. So what we'll do is we'll make you a case manager, which is like the kid out of school starts. And I said to him, there's no way that we'll do that. I said, I was at that point, I said, 25 years, I've been you know, head of programs, running programs, I said, I've been doing what you do. I said, you think I'm going to go? He said, well, we'll let you keep the title and we'll pay you the same. I said, it's not a matter of the money. It's what I do. And um, I left, and I walked out. I said, you know what? I am not going back into this. I refuse to ever go back anymore. My doctor would even said to me, he says, you know, if you keep it up, he says, it's a stroke or a heart attack. Take your choice. If that's what you you." And I said, I'm not crazy. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And I stayed out for about a year. And I was fortunate, and I blessed the pay, that I got into um, teaching at Turo. I actually started by doing advisement, hmm. uh, academic advisement and then got to start teaching. And for the last um, eight, nine years or so, I think about nine years now or 10 years uh, doing the advisement, about eight, eight years or nine years doing uh, the teaching, I've never been happier in my life. I don't consider it work. It's, to me, it is pure fun. I never had so much enjoyment doing, I get up in the morning, I once said to my father, I said, when would I ever get, because I'm not a morning person, I said, when would I ever get up at 6.30 or, or 6 o'clock in the morning and have a smile on my face. Um, I work at, at nights. Some nights I don't finish till 9.20. I get home at quarter to 10, 10 o'clock. It's a smile on my face. Even though I have to be back the next morning, 9 o'clock sometimes. So I love it. That's great. Um, so you, you said your sister got married. She moved to Teaneck. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, so did she have any children? Or you, yes, you're, you're she has them? three amazing kids, and she now has four amazing grandchildren. Oh, wow. Um, her daughter was the first, Ricky, um, and uh, Ricky was an unbelievable baby. She was so much fun. And um, she got married. She now lives in Canada because she married a Canadian. Mm. Uh, thank God all the kids are registered as Americans. <laughs> um, and then she has uh, a son, Avi. Uh, he was the warmest, cuddliest little kid you ever saw, uh, and he's still that today, and he's a doctor. Okay. And her youngest, um, who is a sports fanatic, we don't know how he ever got through college, let alone high school or any that, because the kid never opened the book. All he would read is sports. Mm -hmm. Play sports, read sports, watch sports, uh, yet managed to be on the dean's list through uh, uh, college. And then he decided he wanted to go to law school. We all cracked up and said, Kobe, you're going to have to read books. Because, yeah, I know. And he, God willing, this April will be graduating law school. That's great. Do they, um, do they ever come back to, or come to Brooklyn? In fact, we're going to my sister. Oh, well, well they, they um, my, um, the one who's the doctor, he's, uh, he comes in and will pick up my father and myself every now and then and just, let's go out for, for dinner. Oh, wow. um, uh, he, he's amazing. Um, my niece, when she comes in, comes to her parents, but occasionally she'll, you know, she'll arrive. My sister comes in to visit every now and then, but most of the time I pick up my father and we go together um, to, uh, to my sister. Like this weekend, my niece is coming in from Canada with all the kids and her husband, and um, we're all going out there to see the kids. The kids are unbelievable. I, 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 and the, the nice part is my sister and I are very close. We speak every single day, if not multiple times a day. And uh, I'm the same with my... Uh, niece and nephews, and with the, with the little kids, so there's no generational thing of where well, you're a great a grand uncle and that it's Uncle Bobby and you know it's just one. So some of the uh, could you say some of the lessons that uh, were imparted to you 
from your grandparents and parents have continued to pass down? Yeah, the closeness. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, what What do you think um, about Brooklyn in particular is special compared to other places? It's 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 different than the Brooklyn that I that I liked a lot better when I was a kid. Um, when I was a kid, it was quieter. <laughs> it was much more traditional. It was much more what we saw as American. We were all Americans. And we looked at everybody as Americans. And we were very, as compared to today in some ways, we were very proud of that. One of the things I always remember was um, uh, on um, Memorial Day, we used to have a huge parade on Eastern Parkway of all the different branches. And uh, we never failed to go to that parade. And you were as proud as can be. And I used to ask my father, I said, Dad, how come you don't march today? He goes, I marched enough, I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> uh, but the, it, it was something, and, and you know, th there was a, a certain respect. For example, uh, we, I went to a yeshiva, but nevertheless, secular studies were as important. It wasn't like that's secular, only the religious ones are important. And we pledged allegiance every day, we learned about being a good citizen, uh, etc., etc. Um, people were, were much more respectful. If you got on a, on, a, on a bus, for example, and there was a woman standing, there weren't any more seats, if you didn't get up to offer a seat, your mother or your father would give you a shot in the ribs. There's a lady. You stand up. Um, when you went to the theater, I mean movies, in those days movies were called theaters, went to the theater, you would dress up. My father would wear a suit and tie and hat to go there. My mother would wear a dress. You didn't go in. And, oh, and nobody wore jeans when I was a kid. My God, jeans, were you, you, that was like for a hick. <laughs> you wore jeans and you snuck into the car when you were going up to the country for the summer. Only, and they weren't called jeans, they were called dungarees in those days. Um, and sneakers, only Ted's. That's the only sneakers that existed. They weren't running shoes, all this kind of thing. And um, you, you may do with what you had to amuse yourself. So for example, uh, we played punch ball, a game that practically doesn't exist anymore, which is the same rules as baseball, that you held a rubber ball in your hand, you threw it up, and you would hit it. And um, you played it in the street, uh, or in an alley. Uh, the alley was hard, of course, it was narrower. If it hit the wall, you were out. Um, uh, you played something called stoop ball, which you probably never heard of either, where you bounced the ball off a stoop, and depending on how many times it bounced before you caught it, it was single, double, triple. You played skelly, which is a game played with bottle caps from sodas. Uh, you drew a skelly board on the, uh, on the street with chalk, and you would shoot the bottle caps and see where it would land and so on. Um, girls would play jacks a lot more and jump rope a lot more. We had a game called boxes where, in a schoolyard where you had the squares of the cement, and you would jump different ways and others would have to follow you and match you. If they couldn't, then they were out. In the Livio, that you probably do have heard of. You have to run and keep, or iron tag, things like that. Um, it, it was a much simpler time, and it was, it was quite enjoyable. Manhattan was always seen as the city, and that was seen as the um, more cultural, upper class kind of people living there. Although my father was born in Manhattan on the Lower East Side, and you knew about the poverty that exists. My father, when he was a kid, my father didn't get his own bed uh, until he went to the Army. He was a kid, he slept on two chairs put together in the summer on the, um, on the fire escape. Uh, when he got a little bit older, he shared a bed with his brother. He also came from a family of six children. And because of the poverty in those days, they had to take in boarders. So the boarders would get the bed. Um, when he went to the army, he got a cot, and that was his first own private bed. So he was born on Lowy's side, and we knew of the poverty. They didn't have, um, when he was a kid, they didn't have indoor plumbing when he was a baby, a little, a little one. Later they moved to a building where they had a bathroom in the hall, uh, gas lights, and you had to feed the meter to keep the gas going, uh, so you would have light and things like that. Um, so we knew about that, but still, by the time I was born, uh, Manhattan had changed. And it was already seen as it. So museums, which my cousins and I would go to very often. In those days, museums were free. Uh, 
um, Museum of Natural History was our favorite because of the dinosaurs. And we would just take the train. And in those days, things were safe. I was nine years old when I would travel from uh, Crown Heights to either Williamsburg to visit my grandparents by myself or to the Lower East Side to stop at my father's store. I would take the, what we used to call the Tompkins Avenue bus, because it ran from Prospect Park all the way down Tompkins Avenue to the Bridge Plaza in Williamsburg. Then you would transfer to the bus over the bridge and walk a few blocks to my father's store. You did that all by yourself. So I saw Elijah Muhammad, for example, preaching in Bed-Stuy in those days, and there was no danger. You weren't afraid, and no one was afraid of you. That changed in the 60s. What about the 60s uh, do you think happened? Well, um, the civil rights movement, which was, which was, as was preached by, for example, Dr. King, uh, was not the civil rights movement that erupted in the, um, in the cities themselves. So the riots happened. Um, and people now, it seems to me, you know, we teach about multiculturalism, but we don't really realize what we're saying sometimes. Uh, multiculturalism, in terms of respect for people's different cultures, is a fine thing. But what we've done now is we've broken people up into groups and labeled them, and each group is now competing with the other group for the limited resources. And it's pitting person against person. Um, the idea of black pride, for example, as, uh, as originally preached, was for, for uh, African Americans not to see themselves as some kind of lower class you know, a person who's not deserving of respect. But it's changed into, I'm better than you. Uh, and the others were pushing back, saying, no, you're not. We're, uh, we're better than you, as opposed to what used to be to a, to a degree. I'm not saying there wasn't tremendous prejudice, because again, I lived in the north, and we didn't see as much as in the south. Um, that, no, we're, we're all deserving of the opportunity. So as a result today, I think uh, Brooklyn is, again, is, is, is broken into so many different groups. For example, here on Kings Highway, when I was a kid, by the way, Kings Highway was a very exclusive uh, area, very exclusive women's shops, for example, and other stores and things like that. Today, it's the whole area, you barely hear a word of English. Um, it's primarily Russian, which is not to say that, again, that there's anything wrong with Russian people, but you don't get the sense of community that used to, used to exist anymore. How was, um, uh, you know, the famous blackout? Uh, how the, first, did, the first one or the second one? We had yeah, well, the, pri primarily the first one. <laughs> um, how did that, uh, do you remember your experience with that? Exactly. I was in biology class as a sophomore in high school when suddenly the lights went out. And uh, so we thought, for, of course, just the fuse blew or something like that. But then it didn't. So uh, we all kind of came out into the hallway, and there was our principal. Um, we were standing there with a little Hanukkah candle. And we were going, well, you know, Rabbi Zuroff, what do you want us to do? Well, what should we do? He goes, uh, I suppose we should go home. So this was uh, late in the evening, later in the evening time. And it was kind of, um, we were able to catch a bus. The bus was still running. But there were no street lights, uh, you know, um, uh, traffic lights on. So it was kind of hairy crossing because at that point I was living uh, in East Flatbush and I had to cross two huge streets, Linden Boulevard and Rockaway Parkway, right by the Brookdale Hospital, which in those days was called Bethel. Uh, and that was hairy. Uh, I remember uh, um, that night, you know, just having uh, uh, flashlights or whatever. And I did go out for a little while and tried to direct uh, traffic at my corner. Uh, to try to help out because it was, uh, again, it was you know, kind of not, not too safe for drivers or for, for pedestrians. But uh, overall, it became a fun night. And by the next day, you had, um, you know, lights were, were coming back, so it was no big deal. The second blackout uh, was uh, uh, much more of a mess, and that's when they had, you know, the riots broke out and things like that, which is, again, what a change. You know, at first it was a fun, a fun night that people, wow, how unusual. And the second time, the anger was coming out, and I don't know what triggered it. I don't remember what, what triggered that. That There's actually a third blackout that happened uh, not that many years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I was at work, and um, again, they were, we couldn't do anything, so we uh, had to go home. And um, that was a misery because it was blistering hot. And there was no air conditioning. And this area, literally, this block, 
was the last one to get lights back on. I remember it was Friday afternoon, Friday afternoon just before the Sabbath was beginning. And I thought I was going to go out. I, it was the first time I had not slept in, um, it was going to go on 48 hours. I, I can't take heat in general. I love freezing cold. And with no air conditioning, I was going out of my mind. I was standing in the shower, trying to cool off. But the, it, nothing, and my apartment is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily hot apartment to start with. Um, and I asked a neighbor of mine, who's not Jewish, but we're very close with her, if she could do me a favor, when the lights come on, just come into my apartment, and because it was the Sabbath, hit every air condition that's in there. Just turn it on. I don't care what, you know, put it on high, let it go. And literally, as I began to go to synagogue, like a miracle, suddenly the lights came on and I ran back upstairs, turned out every air conditioner that was, and was very grateful for it. Stupidly, I didn't realize that at least for an hour, I could have gone down to my car, you know, and put the air conditioner on in my car, and then it just cooled off a little bit. But I didn't think of it. Um, so that covers the blackouts. Uh, probably the most uh, tragic day, uh, of course, in New York's recent history. It's 9 11. What do you remember during that period? I wasn't home. Oh. I was in Florida. I had finally taken a vacation after several years. And I had just gone to Disney. And I wake up in the morning, it was 8 o'clock, I still remember. And I turned on the TV to uh, get the weather for the day. And I see this corner and go, what the heck is this? I start watching it going, I said, how? I couldn't understand what was going on because I said, it's a no-fly zone by the uh, World Trade Center. And as I'm listening to this and watching this, I see the next plane go in. Which just, I mean, you didn't know what, you just didn't know what the hell was going on. And interestingly, my first thing was to try to get a call back to New York to my, um, to my uh, um, office because I was working uh, at that point with um, schizophrenics. Um, uh, by the way, magnificent population to work with. I had to love those, those six years working with them. To find out where are the guys, because some of our guys had to travel to um, various programs. Uh, you know, and I did get through. I got through them before I even called my parents. Uh, you know, where are the guys? Are they all safe? And thankfully, they were, they were, all, they were all home. Um, and then I got through to my parents. It took quite a while. Disney was very nice to us, by the way. They uh, opened the phone lines. Uh, no, it wasn't considered a long distance call or anything. Just call whoever you had to. It was very hard to get through because of the busy things. You can imagine the lines were flooded. Um, and then uh, they had to. Ev we were in one of the parks, and then they had to evacuate the park. Uh, we didn't know at that point about Washington, so we were at the park, and the announcement comes uh, due to the events in Washington and. Um, New York, the park has to be evacuated. Okay, and I remember we, what happened, you know, we asked, and then we heard that the Pentagon was hit. And one woman started crying, and she said, oh my God, we're at war, we're at war. And we were, we were kind of scared. And the reason we were being evacuated is because the rumor was, they didn't know, that there was a plane headed to, for Disney. Mm -hmm. And that jets were being scrambled, so on and so forth. So they evacuated us all back to the main areas by our hotels, and we sat basically the entire day watching what was unfolding, uh, uh, just watching it, and everyone was literally stunned. One of the things that happened to me was, um, this was just before Rosh Hashanah. I was supposed to come home, Rosh Hashanah was that um, Monday night, I believe it was, either Sunday night or Monday night. I was supposed to go home, uh, um, catch a plane home Thursday, Thursday night. Uh, as, you can, as you knew, there were no planes flying. We didn't know what the heck to do. So I thought I'd rent the car, and I'll start driving. Uh, you couldn't rent the car because another rumor had it that there was a certain car they were looking for, uh, that it was loaded with uh, explosives, and therefore no car companies were able to rent you a car. Um, I said, I'll take the train. Well, for love of money, you could not get to a phone or get on a train. Luckily, I met this wonderful couple who we, every year we send a Christmas card to each other. Even though I'm Jewish and they're, they're not, we send Christmas cards back and forth. Um, Debbie and Richie, and um, they were on the phone with Amtrak, and they said, you know what, we won't hang up, we'll just put you on. Now what Amtrak did at that point, finally, um, this is like after a, a day, they uh, opened up the uh, auto train to people, even if you didn't have a car, mm -hmm. they'd let you on. Um, so they, we made reservations, and I remember Debbie, Richie, and I, we shared a cab with the train station was out in the middle of no place. It was this little shack. 
um, you know, like you see in the old westerns. And we, we took a cab there. I think it was about an hour drive, a 45 minute drive. And um, believe it or not, I said, you know, I'm just going to ask, but I'm sure they, they don't. Uh, I, I'm going to ask in, in that little shack, do you by any chance have kosher meals? Because it was going to be a, uh, um, over a day's trip. And they said, would you like uh, chicken, fish, or meat? I said, you kidding? I said, yeah, sure. You know, so I ordered. I had had in my backpack um, some you know, cans of food, things like that. And there was another turn that uh, right sitting right behind me, another Jewish girl who also ate kosher. And I said to her, you know, run in quick before the train leaves. I said, if you don't, I said, you can have whatever I have, you know, my backpack, you know, take care of it. So we, uh, we got on the train. And um, first we went to Virginia. It was overnight. But on the train with us were the Boston Red Sox. Because they had been playing in Florida when 9-11 happened, and they couldn't get a flight either. Hmm. So it was very funny. They came walking through the cars to go to the dining car. And there was an older woman who was a sports fan. And she looks, she goes, oh, she was from New York. She looks and she goes, oh, look, it's the Boston Red Sox. I don't like them. <laughs> Did I just say that out loud? <laughs> um, they were very nice. Um, David Cohn was still a pitcher for them at that point. And, you know, you don't want to bother them. Because, you know, everybody, you know. I just remember when he walked by, I just said, Mr. Cohn, I said, we still miss you in New York. And one of the other men came back afterwards. He said, I want you to know you made his day because he really wanted to stay in New York. Uh, and then we, we spent the evening. Uh, um, they showed a movie in the dining car. Uh, a couple of the players were there. And they were happy to talk with us. Uh, the catcher, I remember, spoke with us. Um, and then we took the train from there to Virginia. At Virginia, you had to get off and take a bus to Washington. And you went right past the Pentagon, and you saw what the heck was happening. And at that point, right overlooking the Pentagon, the bus driver stops the bus and gets up and says, just a moment. And we said, oh my god, he might be one of them. Mm. And we thought we were all dead. And uh, luckily, it turned out that no, he stopped the bus because he had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but we were, people were really scared. It was this big black driver, and people were really worried that he's going to try to do something. But, um, from, from Virginia, you took the bus, we went to Washington, then you had to catch a train uh, for, uh, to go back to New York City. Uh, we get to the train, and uh, they said, no, you don't have uh, reservations, you can't get on. And um, they had told us on the way in that, no, everyone who was on that train was given seats. Yeah. So I told him that, and I said, well, I don't know anything about it. You can't get on the train. And it's not like the train was full, by the way. It was really funny because the train was mostly empty. So we ran back to, this was already Friday morning. We ran back to the um, uh, I guess station master, whatever you want to call them, and told him what's happening. He says, no, he says, you guys are cleared. So he ran up with us and told the conductor, all these people look cleared. So we got on the train, took the train to Manhattan, uh, Grand Central. At Grand Central, you had to get a subway, and we didn't know if the subways were running. Mm. So luckily they were. I got home just a short while before the Sabbath started, uh, and was home in time for Rosh Hashanah. I had already made plans, though, in Florida. I went to the Disney desk. They were very helpful. And I asked, could you contact the rabbi uh, for me? I said, I told him what was happening, and in case I can't get out, uh, he'll help me. And um, they did. They got me you know, the name and number. And uh, the only thing I felt bad about that was um, I had no, um, I didn't have a suit or anything. I was wearing, you know, kind of very casual. You don't want to go into a synagogue dressed like that. That's not how you, you go. But um, luckily, I, I got home. Uh, and then, of course, um, Saturday, you know, we went to synagogue. And um, people were just, we were really very, very uh, down. And, and it just hurt. And you didn't know what to do. And you wanted to be together, and you wanted to hear the rabbi say something, uh, which he did that was you know, comforting to, to people. And you wanted to hear the prayers that are being said for the government, and so on and so forth. And I guess a while later, the sadness gave way to the anger and the desire for revenge. And when Bush said, you know, they'll hear from us, it was like, yeah, let's get them. <laughs> what do you remember about... Uh, when you got back, uh, you know, was there a feeling of community? Uh, was yes. there a feeling, like, what, what was different about when you left than yes. when you came back? For a, for a short time, unfortunately, everybody was here. First of all, we were all Americans again. 
Uh, in fact, so much so that my aunt, who is uh, extraordinary liberal and, and a very nice person, uh, her neighbor made a remark, oh, we came out of Russia to be safe, and now look what happens here. And she said, well, if you don't like it, you can always go back. <laughs> Uh, because we were Americans and we were proud of it. And I had, um, I still have my uh, flag on my car and had it on my lapel. And um, we really, everyone rallied around the flag. I remember um, saying, you know, if I was young enough at that point, I think I would have enlisted. I actually, at one point, by the way, did try to enlist. It was after I finished graduate school and I wanted to go in as an officer. Uh, and figured I can get attached to the hospital as a, you know, either a psychiatric social worker or a psychologist. And I remember the uh, Navy at that point said they had no programs for that. The Air Force said at that point you needed your PhD plus five years experience. The Army said, we have a great program. I said, good, let's hear it. Uh, he said, you come and you do your basic training. I'm going up, oh, we got a problem right here and there. Because if you start with your basic training, regular basic training, they can send you anywhere afterwards. He says, and then we give you six stripes. I said, well, suit traps is very nice. I said, but how about a, a bar? And they said, well, then you can go to Officer's Candace School. I said, no, no, I had enough school ready. I said, and I want to get assigned to the hospital. Well, you can try. Uh, no, no. So we, we tried for a while, but we couldn't reach a deal <laughs> on it. So and at that point, uh, well, uh, about four or five years later, the Navy called me and said, uh, yes, now we're in dying. Because, you know, the Navy go out on cruises for months at a time, and the families are falling apart back home. It's stressful. But at that point, I had a good job. <laughs> I said, well, thank you, but no thank you. Um, were you here during Sandy? Yeah, but we, to, for the, uh, to be honest, we on this block had no effect whatsoever. It was just a heavy rain to us. Yeah. Me, personally, we have a wonderful landlord. He doesn't believe in fixing roofs or bricks. So we had some water, you know, uh, seeping through. But uh, believe it or not, actually a couple days ago, after multiple complaints for 30 years to the city, we actually had someone come up and uh, fix the bricks the last few days. So we're hoping maybe not. But uh, we were not here. We were not affected. Yet several blocks down towards Sheepshead Bay, people were devastated. So we really didn't get affected by it. Uh, has there been uh, any, I mean, what do you think the most positive and, and the most negative change over the past, you know, the period that you I guess your entire life uh, has been in Brooklyn. The most positive change in terms of, 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 of the community as a whole, I think, were wrought by uh, uh, Mayor Giuliani. Uh, he, he is one of the only politicians whose hand I would like to shake. Um, he, uh, the, city had got, the city as a whole, but parts of Brooklyn had gotten where it was literally ungovernable. Um, I remember, for example, going for a job interview in Red Hook. And I didn't know what Red Hook was in those days. And um, they gave me directions. And they said, get off the bus, and you see Smith Street here, and you walk right, and you, OK. And I dressed up in a suit, my attache case. And I get off at Smith Street, and it's like uh, just an empty sand, you know, it wasn't even paved parts of it. And I'm looking around, I go, I don't understand where, and I can't find any Smith Street. I'm looking around, looking around. And there's like a dust cloud coming at me, and it's a police car. And two cops roll up. And uh, they say to me, uh, what are you doing here? So I told them. They said, mister, he said, nobody walks over here. I said, well, what am I supposed to do? I said, I have an interview and I'm trying to find. They said, so one cop looked the other and said, we're not allowed to do this, but get in the car. They took me in the car, drove me to the door, waited for me to get inside, said to me, when you're ready to leave, call a cab, wait inside, do not stand outside. When the cab comes, get into the cab and get out of here as fast as you can. It's too dangerous. Um, I actually, when working with a, a little girl uh, from Red Hook, I remember she said to me, this is later on, she said to me, uh, yeah, I know what to do by the windows. I said, what do you mean? She says, you have to duck. I said, why do you duck by the windows? She says, well, that's where the bullets come through. Um, so anyway, so it had reached that kind of point, and you were scared. You didn't go out at night. Um, it, it, the trains, everything was, you know, when are you going to get mugged type of thing. And I had been mugged more than once, unfortunately. Um, I think that, that today people don't, don't even, young people today don't even know of such a thing. Uh, and I think, that, you know, people 
feel freer to go in here. Um, uh, even Red Hook is getting somewhat gentrified at this point. The yeah, opening up of, I think it was at Ikea or uh, one, has made a, a, made a Home Depot, has made major differences. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that, that's a major change for, for the better. People are, are out, people go shopping, people go on trains, they don't really think about it that much. What do you, um, do you think there's been a negative change uh, in Brooklyn in the past? Again, the only negative, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of communities, is this idea of pitting one group against the next. The Russians, uh, I'm sure maybe their grandchildren will feel more acculturated, but right now there's still that, that divide. I see it even in the college uh, crowd. As I said, I teach, I teach college, uh, and these are young people in their early 20s, some of them, and they still hold themselves apart from the American uh, uh, students in, in many ways. Uh, and they also still have, it's hard for them to acculturate. They still have certain ways of doing things that they learned from their parents, grandparents who suffered under a, a, a communist regime. So cheating, for example, is not seen the same way as um, maybe you and I see cheating. Cheating was a way to survive in communist Russia. So for them to cheat on a test, it's, it's not the sin that we see it as. And you know, you, you do get expelled for cheating. And uh, same thing with plagiarism. It's, it's a survival mechanism. So I find I have to be a little more um, strict, put it that way, in terms of watching and at the same time understanding. And if I see something happening, saying, come on, guys, you've know, you got to move apart. You've got to do your own work. You know, I see it. Come on. Don't do it. As opposed to, um, well, what happened in Brooklyn College, uh, in one of the auditoriums, they have cameras now that will surveil during finals. And one of these professors saw somebody cheating zoomed in on the camera, took the picture, and the student was expelled for cheating. So I, I, I don't have the heart to do that uh, to somebody, because I still remember what it was like to struggle. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered that um, you'd like to touch on? I, I, I just think that well, one of the things that, that I, by the way, do want to give credit to, uh, to Mayor Bloomberg, and I don't know, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope that maybe I had a little play in this. When he was first elected mayor, uh, I had met him while he was campaigning in Borough Park and actually got to speak with him and also um, to speak for him to a reporter who was being extraordinarily nasty and personal um, and kind of said to the reporter, look, the man answered your question. You're just trying to trip him up. You're trying to make him say something that he didn't say, that kind of thing. He doesn't remember me, of course, but the, uh, I was, he was campaigning and he was there with... Um, uh, um, Commissioner Bratton, who, by the way, is a real Marine. Uh, I mean, this man was still ramrod straight, hoo -ah, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. or, or uh, Semper Fi, rather, hoo -ah, is the Army. Anyway, um, and I wrote him a letter and sent a lot of uh, supporting documentation on the importance of uh, trees and that New York is, in many areas, has been denuded of trees. And wouldn't it be nice for him to be known as the mayor who re-greened New York, just as Giuliani is known as the mayor who um, uh, um, you know, re-civilized uh, New York. And then in his last year, he started that one million tree program, which, uh, who knows? I don't know, but maybe I planted a seed in his, in his mind. <laughs> but I, I happen to love that. I love trees. Interesting story about how, how I happen to also become very sensitive to that. I was a little kid. I used to walk to school, so I only lived about four blocks away. And uh, you know how little kids walk by bushes at times and just sort of pull off some leaves? I was walking down Montgomery Street, and I did exactly that. I walked by and I pulled off a couple of leaves from a bush. And all of a sudden I looked at it in my hand, and I said, oh my God, these were living a minute ago, and look what I did. I killed them. Never again did I pluck a leaf. I still won't do it. Um, I just... How do you just kill something for no reason? Yeah. Um, and it, it always stuck with me. And I just have this love of trees and grass, although I'm allergic to some of it. Um, you can't have enough trees. And they just put one this past year in front of uh, the building that I live in. And I was like thrilled. <laughs> uh, awesome. So it's been an interesting place to, to grow up in. You grow, you grow up kind of fast. Um, I think another change, by the way, is um, except in certain areas, and that's a cultural thing. Uh, but in those days, in all areas, everybody on the block was your mother or father. 
you did something wrong, your parents knew about it right away from everyone on the block. And there was also a major uh, change that I noticed in terms of respect for clergy. When I was a kid, it didn't matter what um, religion it was. If it was a clergy person, male or female, nun or priest or pastor, um, you had respect. Because they were a clergy person. So I remember on my block, we had an amazing rabbi, a young man, who I don't know if you remember the uh, television show Zorro. It was a television show back in the, I guess, late 50s to early 60s, maybe. Uh, I forgot the name of the, uh, the author, of the, author, of the uh, actor who played Zorro, but very handsome man with this pencil-thin mustache. This rabbi was one of these holiday, uh, Hollywood, unbelievably handsome uh, men. Uh, and he loved kids also. And um, he was only in his 30s when I met him. I was five years old. He was probably in his early 30s. And um, we lived on the same block. And uh, he loved the kids. So when he would come back from synagogue on, on uh, uh, Saturday morning, let's say, we had several uh, kids who lived in the apartment houses on the corner who were Jewish. And they would come to the synagogue, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and that would really be it. Um, uh, and they would be smoking. But when they'd see the rabbi, they would immediately put out cigarettes. Not because he would ever yell at them or anything, simply out of respect. Now he, on the other hand, to show you the difference of the way things are today, he would go over and always stop and talk with them. How's school? How are your parents? What's doing with you? You know, what are your plans for the summer? And so on and so forth. Uh, one time I remember him walking by and, uh, during the weekday, and he saw them burning their Regents book. <laughs> and he looked at it and he said to them, feels good, doesn't it? Um, many, many years later, he had moved to Israel and became head of a yeshiva there. And uh, he came, he, we'd come back periodically to New York. And I was able to get through to him on the phone, because he was, at that point, he had become very popular. And he couldn't, he says, my own brother didn't get through me yet. I said to him, Rabbi Chait, is there any possibility that I can pick you up anytime, any place? please come visit my parents. Now, my mother grew up with him in Williamsburg, and she said when his wife, Esther, started dating him, she said, all oh, the girls were so jealous, because he was so handsome. And, and even as a, as a young, a five-year-old, I recognized that this man is unbelievable, unbelievable looking his personality. So he said, of course, it's your family. He says, of course you're going to. And I was friends with his, his, his uh, uh, sons. His oldest son was my babysitter today. He's also a well-known rabbi and things like that. Anyway, um, so he came and my father said, one of the things I want to tell you, Rabbi Chay, I always remember how you would go to talk to those boys on our block. And he looked at my father with this look of incredulity and he said, but I love them. My father said, that's what I mean. And um, when I was a kid, Carvel was new. And uh, we didn't know if it was kosher or not. And we had never seen soft ice cream before. Um, Rabbi Chait was the one who went on a Saturday night to check it out. And he came back, boys, it's kosher. <laughs> and we went running you know, like mad. Uh, kosher pizza didn't exist in Brooklyn at that point. Um, it opened on a Saturday night on Kingston and Empire, a little shop called Shopsy and Naftali. Kosher pizza. Uh, there was one kosher pizza in Borough Park, but in those days, Borough Park was like a foreign land. It was so far away. Uh, so this one opened up. And the night that they opened, the crowd was so huge that we had to have the police come out to keep the people in line. And pizza cost 15 cents in those days a slice. Um, um, you know, these are the kind of things that we had a little stamp store uh, next to the pizza shop, sold stamps and uh, coins. And I was a coin collector. And one day, you know, you knew that if there was ever a misprint in a coin, it's worth a fortune. So one day, I'm looking at this coin, it's 1957, and I'm looking at the word liberty, and it looks like it's spelled L-I-B, looks like there's a little I in there, E-R-T-Y. So I get my little um, viewer from my microscope, it's like a 10 times power, and I'm looking at it, and go, oh my God, there is something there. I figured, I won, you know, in those days, it was the Irish sweepstakes that were around. Um, and I go right to the store, and he says, yeah, it's 1957. I said, they all have them. <laughs> oh, gee. I know. <laughs> there it went. Um, I also almost got arrested one night. This was very funny. Our home court uh, for basketball was Wingate High School. Um, and uh, I took my guitar with me one time to a game. And afterwards, you walk from, from Wingate, you walk up to the pizza shop. And... Uh, <laughs> I went in to get pizza, and I asked someone to hold my guitar, and they were playing it. Now, this is at like 11.30 at night, 
you didn't make noise in those days. Mm. And the cop was there, and he obviously had told that guy to be quiet. Okay, now I come out. I don't know. He didn't say anything to me, so I start playing. <laughs> the cop goes, that's it. I told you. And he grabs me by arm, and he's pulling me down to the precinct on the Empire Boulevard. And I'm going, but officer, it's not me. It's not. Look, and finally, I saw or other, I managed to get him to stop. I said, did you please just look at me? I said, am I the one you spoke to? No, no, it wasn't you. I said, but I'm warning you now. He said, okay. I said, you know, fine. But, uh, and in those days, by the way, when you got arrested for something, you're in your own trouble. Go get yourself out of it. You didn't have lawyers come running in, they seal you and all this kind of... Yeah, and, and, and it wasn't like today where, yeah, big deal. And you didn't call cops pigs. Um, it, it was it, the 50s and the early 60s were a happy time. Okay, the hippie movement was, was kind of fun. Uh, you know, had things like that. And at one point, I believe it or not, I did have long hair. Uh, now, I think uh, when they cut it, they took the whole thing with it. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it, it, it was good. And school was a place that you really were expected to achieve. There was no such thing in those days uh, as being uh, just passed along as you were you know, a nice kid in class. Uh, you behaved well or something like that. There was no social, uh, what they call it, social promotion. It didn't exist. You, you, my, my high school had no problem expelling you or, uh, or leaving you back. Uh, we had a young man in my class who today is a, uh, he's written movies and he's uh, in Hollywood. His name was uh, Robert Averett. And Sunday morning, we had, we had school on Sunday mornings also. Um, and we, we were in our history class, and our teacher was Lieutenant Lowell K. Sanders, U.S. Army, U.S. Navy underwater demolition. He was a frogman during World War II. And he ran the class like a ship, and we loved him. Uh, and he walks in, and Bob Averick was a uh, new transfer student. It was his first Sunday, and he was wearing jeans. You never came to school like that. You had to wear regular pants, regular shoes. You carried your sneakers with you for gym and a regular shirt, no poetry. Well, Bob Abbott didn't know. And in walks uh, Mr. Sanders, and he sees him goes, In my class? Out! Threw him right out. And the principal had to come and explain that it was his first Sunday he didn't know. And, you know, it was, it was really, we had a lot of fun. But you worked hard. You worked hard, you were expected, you were, you were expected to be responsible. And as I said, when you finish school, you're expected to get a job. I don't know of a single person, um, not, not in my family and not of my friends, who would ever have considered anything like um, uh, um, uh, uh, any kind of welfare, food stamp, whatever. You were expected to, to make good. And it, and it wasn't out of being boastful as ever, it's because you wanted to do it. You were, yeah. You're proud of what you, of what you do. Yeah. And it's, uh, well, th I mean, this has been a great interview. I really Thank appreciate you. you taking the time.